Hey everybody, I know sometimes the topics I cover on this channel can get a little bit intense, perhaps like this video you guys are gonna be watching today. So I just wanted to remind you guys that my puppy Casper has his own YouTube channel. So if you need a little bit of wholesome goodness after this video, make sure to check it out. Links for his channel will be in the description box down below or just type in Casper the Friendly Floof on YouTube. Love you guys, let's get into the video. Hello everybody and welcome back to the channel. My name is Blair or the Illuminati and today we're going to be discussing a company or a cult or whatever you want to call it. It's called Nexium though. Nexium may not be one of the more well-known MLMs I've covered, but they're definitely vastly more disturbing and the most cult-like organization I think I've come across aside from actual cults. Interestingly enough, Nexium doesn't sell anything either, not products I mean. What they sold were personal growth seminars up until they were shut down. And yeah, you heard that right. I know we hope time and time again that these MLMs get shut down for being a pyramid scheme and taking advantage of people, but today, Today, the MLM we're discussing was shut down for things in an entirely different direction. Even though the case has been pretty much closed, this is a company, if you can <laughs> even call it that, that's always interested me. So let's just dive into it and get ready for some real scary horror stories. Let's go. I'll very briefly go over Nexium's founder here because even before this saga of MLM cultishness can even start, it's important to know that Nexium was pretty much on bad footing even before it began. Keith Rainier, the Nexium founder, has a dark and very alarming past. Even as a child, he had a strange view about people and a perspective on the world that was really kind of concerning. As a boy, he read Isaac Asimov's sci-fi novel about a brilliant scientist who knew his galaxy was in irremedial decline and had reduced all human behavior to elegant mathematical equations. It inspired Rainier later to try and do the same. Keith went on to eventually study math and physics at the Polytechnic Institute, but it wasn't long before the first crime, not just a red flag, but a crime took place. In 1984, when he was 24 years old, he slept with a 15 year old girl, but Keith apparently explained to the girl's older sister that her sister's soul was much older than her biological age. So uh, yeah, that's not how law works. I don't care if that teenager had a soul that was a thousand years old, according to this guy. That's illegal, she's underage. This isn't some anime shit where she's actually a 4,000 year old vampire. I don't wanna fucking hear it. This is not legal. Her name was Gina Hutchinson and she'll be mentioned later, but I'm sure you can already see why this will probably be one of the more disturbing MLMs I've covered. Also in the 80s, Keith worked for Amway, no surprise there really, and in 1989 was cited in the Guinness Book of World Records for being one of three people in the world with an IQ superior to the rest of humanity. In the 90s, Keith made his own pyramid scheme, not Nexium, at least not yet. This one was called Consumer's Byline. Keith apparently founded this on the principle that a more ethical world would consist of people that understood and pursued their goals in aggressive and ruthless ways, which is just rich coming from the guy that slept with a minor, but okay, let's continue. In 1990, Rainier decided to apply his theory to a new business, Consumer's Byline, a multi-level marketing program near Albany that promised lucrative commissions to old customers for recruiting new ones. He barnstormed the nation, promoting discounts on groceries, dishwashers, and even hotel stays, stroking crowds of a thousand pumped up and profit hungry people. He was like a mythological figure. The guy with the 240 IQ was coming to town, says Robert Bremer, a former distributor for the outfit. Rainier says by the end of 1993, he had sold $1 billion in goods and services, employed 80 people, and had a quarter million believers paying him $19 a month to hawk his goods. He claims he was worth 50 million, yet he appeared to carry no money, says Bremer, adding that Rainier seemed to sleep all day, rolled into his office around 10 p.m., and sometimes held meetings at 1 a.m. Business flagged, debt ballooned, and customers complained. Regulators in 20 states began to investigate. In 1993, the New York Attorney General filed a civil suit alleging consumers' byline was a pyramid scheme. Without admitting wrongdoing, Rainier settled for $40,000, of which he only paid $9,000 as of a 2003 when this article was written. He says he can't pay the rest, though he also says his ample finances let him live on savings. To be clear, a guy with an IQ of 240, supposedly, couldn't figure out how to run an MLM without being shut down for a pyramid scheme allegations. Okay, sure. That's why I don't believe he's a smart man. A smart man wouldn't sleep with a teenager and create an MLM, but Keith wasn't done, obviously. A year later, he made another MLM that failed called National Health Network. They sold vitamins, but again, it was short-lived. The third MLM was called Executive Success Programs, later rebranded as what we will be focusing on today, Nexium. 
Keith started this with Nancy Salzman, a psychiatric nurse at the time. Now that you know a bit about the founder and have an idea for what's to come, let's start getting into Nexium as a business. Now, there are a lot of documentaries or video essays on Nexium. one from Investigation Discovery, another from Lifetime. There's a book called The Program, a podcast, and HBO intends to cover this as well. Obviously, I can't go over every single one of their accounts on this story or we'd be here for years, but I'm going to piece together everything we can from the various sources, and there are a lot of sources for this one. Nexium members had a 12-step mission statement once they entered the company, one that they would pledge to ethically control as much of the money, wealth, and resources of the world as possible. <laughs> yeah, that's real. Keith also demanded that he be called Vanguard in meetings and for Salzman, perfect. I will not once be referring to them in those terms throughout this video because these people don't deserve their self-imposed titles or even a shred of respect. One of the most notable people Nexium recruited was Allison Mack. She was on Smallville in 2001 when Nexium members targeted her, introducing themselves as a mentorship program. They held a seminar about empowering women and to Mac, meeting one of the most intelligent man, finding mentorship as she reached celebrity status at only 18, must have sounded promising. With a lot of MLMs or strange companies, from Tyra Banks' MLM to Goop, the celebrity stamp of approval brings companies miles ahead of where they should be. Keith lured her into the group and Mac, in return, targeted sororities with young women that would trust her, look up to her, and join. At first, upon reading all of this, I didn't understand why these women wouldn't just run for the hills, just nope out of there, just anything. With hindsight, it seems so obvious this was a horrible idea. However, Keith Rainier has a way about him that I can't exactly describe. Do you know what I'm going to say right now? No. You're insecure about that. Yeah. Is that scary for you? No. Why not? Because I trust that what you're gonna say is gonna be good and- be And in fine. the end, you're gonna be okay. Be fine, yeah. When we have insecurities, and this relates to vulnerability, uh -huh where we think we may not be okay, then it becomes scary. See, it's not the insecurity that's the problem, it's the fear of the insecurity. I can see why he was so successful at preying upon people, hearing him speak. In one video with Allison Mack, he has such an eerie way about him. I don't feel like the word manipulative just does it justice. He tells Allison she's insecure about what he's going to say next and asked, is that scary for you? Out of context, without the cult background, this may not seem like a big deal, it's just one conversation. But some of the phrases he uses are just weird. It's hard for a person to be deeply authentic mm -hmm. if they're inauthentic with themselves. Mm -hmm. And people who are inauthentic with themselves, the nature of being inauthentic with yourself is that you're blind to it. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, you'd be authentic with yourself and then you'd be sort of conning yourself on top of it. Right. But true self-inauthenticity is blindness, it's an incompletion. Mm -hmm. But with understanding this philosophically and opening these areas up, then what are the practices? What are the actual practical tools right. that allow you to, if you will, it's, a, it's almost custom design. You, know, you might call it designer emotional states, right. designer emotional capacity, designer uh, emotional transitions. Yeah. Not only how do you design them, but how do you practice them? It's hard for a person to be deeply authentic if they're inauthentic with themselves. Sounds so deep and so thoughtful. On the surface, he comes across like a wise, intelligent man, when in reality, that phrase holds almost no weight. You can't be honest if you lie to yourself. If I say that in plain wording without his tone, yeah, it's pretty obvious. Yet Keith's manipulations are top notch. I'm not sure if he actually believes what he's saying or he's just using it as a tactic, but without his language and tone, I doubt he would have gotten this far. And at first, Nexium appeared like a life-changing event for these people. Recruits paid more than $7,500 for grueling 12-hour incentives featured Nexium's patented executive success program technology, a patchwork of various self-help programs, religious ideologies, and hypnosis techniques. They could also take classes through the smaller companies under the Nexium umbrella. The Source, a workshop for actors led by Mac, Delegates, a task rabbit esque startup primarily staffed by younger female members, and JNESS, a female empowerment group whose Facebook wall features Martin Luther King Jr. quotes juxtaposed against a pastel pink template. I left my five day, my initial training, as if a veil had been lifted and I could see things more clearly in my life. I could communicate better with people. 
That sounds fantastic. It, yeah, it was great. People that took it described it as so enlightening, or like a veil was being lifted. It was undoubtedly effective, but not because this information was so profound and Keith was revealing secrets of the world or anything. Plain and simple, this really looks like brainwashing. Rick Ross studies groups like Nexium. In my opinion, it's basically copied from other sources, uh, specifically Scientology, Ayn Rand, and EST. So there's all of that mixed together, and that becomes Nexium. Experts have said it's like a copy of Scientology or other similar cult-like beliefs. It's not original, and it's not truly life-changing. Still, that's what it's described as by Nexium leaders. And the first step is making a vow of obedience to her as me being a slave and her being my master. Again, slave? She slave. used the word slave. She used the word slave. And women were even blackmailed to keep Nexium secrets. Sarah Edmondson, featured on ABC News, says she gave Laura Salzman, Nancy Salzman's daughter, a written confession and nude photos so she couldn't leave without fear of repercussion. Warren Salzman had demanded highly compromising collateral. You need to provide something to me that I'm gonna hold forever just to confirm and to, and to solidify that you'll never share the secret. So what did you give her? So I gave her a written confessional. Women were hoping for a giant makeover and inspiration. Those that joined were told to diet and eat 800 calories a day instead of the 2000 recommended. But I'm sure followers found a way to justify that. He was only helping them change their lives, right? And being pushed was fair if they broke the diet, right? Because they should be following the rules to better change their lives. Well, it's worth noting here that when you're starving, like literally starving yourself, it's much harder to concentrate. One woman that had tried the diet said she absolutely believed she was more suggestible, moody, and lightheaded. After the diet, however, there were more behaviors that women justified in their minds, like branding. I'm going to warn you, things start to get pretty graphic from here. I want to say, oh, it gets better, and hey, come back in two minutes and things will die down, but that's not the case. Things get worse. If you don't believe you'll be able to handle mentions of branding and slavery, I'd recommend clicking away, and I more than understand. There was a method to the branding. It was supposed to be precisely seven strokes, one line across and two diagonal lines to form a sideways K, then four smaller lines to form the sideways R beneath and the little spoon to the big spoon of the K. The women were supposed to be naked. They were supposed to be videotaped. They were supposed to be held down on a table, arms above the head, legs spread, ankles and wrists bound, helpless, vulnerable, exposed. And they were supposed to say the following, please brand me, it would be an honor. An honor I would want to wear for the rest of my life. That last part is the most important. They should probably say that before they're held down so it doesn't seem like they're being coerced, Keith Rainier told actress Alison Mack, his lover, disciple, and slave. And Keith branded these women with his initials. She says she was told the brand was a Latin symbol, but realized it really included the letters K and R, which are also the initials of Keith Ranieri. I lost it when I figured that out. You're stamped as property of somebody? I'm not cattle. I'm not owned by Keith. Sarah Edmondson says she thought about getting a tattoo at first and then even believed her branding was a Latin symbol. But Sarah describes the ordeal as worse than childbirth. It was the most inhumane, horrific way to treat anybody. What was that like? It was worse than childbirth. It was worse than childbirth? Yeah. It was, imagine a hot laser dragged across your flesh for 30 minutes without anesthetic. When she realized the branding was KR, Keith's initials, she was furious and said she's not cattle. Unfortunately, many of these women were treated worse than cattle. Although the branding may have actually been Mac's idea because Allison said a tattoo wasn't intense enough, it was Keith that truly ran the operation. Keith's ex-girlfriend Natalie says that even before Nexium, what Keith was able to do was immediately ascertain your weak points and insecurities. And then he takes those insecurities and convinces you he's helping you with them, but it's just things he uses to hold you hostage. These women were sex slaves for Rainier. There's no gentle way to say that, and I don't want to diminish their suffering by calling them his partners or lovers. These women didn't feel that they had a choice. They'd been brainwashed, they were starving, they were branded, and higher-ups in Nexium had nude photos of them to blackmail them. That's not a partnership. They were slaves and they were tortured. It wasn't until 2017 that the full extent of what Nexium really was came into light, thanks to Frank Parlato, a former Nexium publicist and Mark Vincente. I'll explain who Mark is first since he's the one who wrote the article calling Vincente a hero to begin with. 
To date, Frank has been accused of fraud and cheating the IRS. He was supposed to stand trial in May, 2020, but because of everything that's going on as of writing this, it doesn't look like that's happening, at least not yet. Frank faces charges for his actions against the IRS and wire fraud, but he is no longer believed to have stolen a million dollars from heirs of the Seagram's liquor fortune. Frank says that in fact, it was Keith Rainier and Claire Bronfman, an heir to the fortune that set him up. Before I continue forward with Frank's investigations, let me back up and tell you who Claire is. There's a lot of people involved in this, so bear with me. Claire Bronfman had been an heiress to billions of dollars before she came involved with this cult. She apparently poured out $150 million into Nexium after her sister, Sarah, began taking their classes. Sarah persuaded Claire, who was 23 and competing as a show jumper for horse shows, to join, and soon they were paying Salzman as a personal coach. Claire bought a house near Nexium's headquarters in Clifton Park, New York, and a horse farm up the road so she could continue her training. Between her classes, she would compete in tournaments. Eventually, she ditched her equestrian sponsor, a German clothing company, and opted instead to wear a purple and black jacket emblazoned with Nexium. Rainier began taking a close interest in Claire, former members say. With no history as an equestrian, he began to train Claire in an effort to get her on the US Olympic team. They encouraged her to compete because Keith thought if Claire made it into the Olympics, he would be known as this great world coach, get fame, and be exposed to the Olympian world, says Barbara Boshi, who was the leader within Nexium. Nexium and Rainier's girlfriend before leaving the group in 2009. Boshi says she remembers going with Salzman and Rainier to watch Claire compete. After making the US team, but failing to make the cut to compete in the Olympics in 2004, Claire eventually stopped competing. Things only spiraled down from there. Although her father, Edgar Bronfman, initially took interest in their courses and referred to Salzman as one of the most influential females in my life, Bronfman wasn't thrilled with how Claire was spending his money. In 2003, just a few years after its inception, Nexium was accused of being a cult. Edgar said this himself in a Forbes article. I think it's a cult, says Bronfman. Though he once took a course and endorsed the program, he hasn't talked to his daughters in months and has grown troubled over the long hours and emotional and financial investment they have been devoting to Rainier's group. One daughter, Claire, 24, has lent the program $2 million at 2.5% interest, the senior Bronfman says. She denies this. Keith, of course, was furious, and they say that because of her father's criticism, Claire had committed an irreparable sin against Nexium. However, we've seen MLMs be accused of cultish behaviors in the past, and as of 2003, this was no different. Nexium was still in business, but whether it was because of the strain put on Claire or simply that she learned to be manipulative from Keith herself, Claire started going after Frank. As he puts it, she knew I had recovered assets for her. I know she knew because she sued the managing partner of the LA real estate project in that civil case in Los Angeles. She testified to all good I had done by recovering $26 million in assets on the project. Then within three months of winning that lawsuit against the managing partner who Keith Rainier selected, she was in the grand jury in Buffalo telling them the exact opposite, that I had cheated her in order to put me in prison. As messed up as this sounds, accusing someone of a crime they didn't commit, I'm grateful it happened. If not, Frank may never have made the in-depth report on Nexium in 2017. He spoke in depth about the branding process and wrote an article citing why Dr. Danielle Roberts, a medical professional that actually carried out this branding, should have her license revoked. He spoke about the Salzmans, posed the question if Claire Bronfman had a 500 calorie diet because Keith says fat on women disturbs the transmission of essential energy to him, and says the actress Nikki Nikki Klein had also been branded. All of these came out in mid-June 2017, including advice from a former Rainier supporter on why people should leave and save their lives. Whether or not Frank did this as some sort of revenge or he was horrified all along, I can't speak to his intentions. But thanks, in part to Frank getting the ball rolling, the New York Times picked up the story. As for Mark Vincente, hopefully you haven't forgotten that name yet, he was another important role and true hero to this Nexium saga. He was the one that put his story out there and gave it the publicity needed. As Frank writes, "'Shortly after I broke the branding story in June 2017 on the Frank Report, and the New York Times was putting together or trying to put together a story. Barry Meyer, the New York Times writer, that most thorough and spectacular wordsmith, a man who can in a thousand words destroy a cult, was seeking to find people to go on the record. 
Naturally, I was willing, but who was I? Just an indicted guy, indicted by Bronfman's lies, who wrote a salacious blog condemning Rainier with every justification to get back at them, maybe with lies. What proof was there that this insane story was true? Meyer needed other people on the record to write a story about the secretive group that branded women. Now, you all know the wealthy Bronfman's propensity to litigate. You must realize that the New York Times has to survive on its credibility, and if you put these two facts together, you will realize how hard it was for the Times to actually publish the story and the only way it was ever going to be published is with ample sources on the record and complete vetting. So who was it going to be on the record? Almost no one. The only woman who was branded, and this was slavery if there ever was, who was willing to go on record and actually show the world the brand was Sarah Edmondson. But I doubt she would have done that if Mark had not been there first, willing to go on the record, putting himself on the line. Mark had his picture taken, him and Bonnie, his wife, for the New York Times. He was then declaring war on Rainier. And again, let me remind you, there was no investigation by law enforcement. He was far more likely to be investigated himself by law enforcement in the Northern District of New York. Keith and the witch-like Claire Bronfman were almost sure to go and file some false criminal complaint against him. If Mark hadn't come out as a former Nexium member to validate Sarah's story, it would have never been told. The New York Times couldn't have picked it up with only one source. Without Mark, Nexium might have taken much longer to take down. So thank you, Mark Vicente, though I know it's a couple years late for telling your story. It was dangerous, and I'm sure it couldn't have been an easy decision to make, but thank you for making it. From there, in late 2017, investigations truly began in earnest. ABC got a hold of the story in December, speaking to the branding ritual with Sarah Edmondson, the former Nexium member I mentioned earlier. Obviously, once the story was released, there were no more excuses. Their secrets were revealed, and Keith Rainier was arrested in late March 2018. Rainier obviously denied having done any wrong at first. His lawyer said everything was consensual. There are well-known groups of men who brand themselves, attorney Mark Agnifino said. A group of women do that and suddenly they're victims. But when pressed about the branding, he replied, I'm not qualified to say what is normal. I understand these are Keith's lawyers. Obviously they're going to say whatever they have to, but it's despicable for anyone anyone to consider branding acceptable. Just because these groups of men are doing it doesn't mean these Nexium women should have been subjected to it. Have they never heard of that phrase, just because everyone is jumping off of a bridge doesn't mean you should? That kind of mindset is what gets us here in the first place. People blindly trusting others like Allison Mack and Rainier's celebrity clients to steer them in the right direction. The charges kept stacking up against Rainier though until they're almost too long to list. Prosecutors said Rainier had a stable of over 50 female slaves. They say he told his followers that men needed multiple sexual partners while women should be monogamous. Nancy Salzman, Keith Rainier's partner, said that Rainier had no knowledge of the Dominus Obsequius Sororium, a phrase which means master over slave women. Apparently, all the brandings and slave meetings were under her watch, as she explained. I was in one mode, Project Keith. My main priority was that Keith was okay. If you ask me, even during the trial, she was in that Project Keith mode because I don't believe for a second Keith wasn't aware of the abuse. At the very least, he was aware of the meetings. According to Salzman, the group would meet three times a week with members required to pose for a naked group photo at the start of every meeting and send it to Rainier. We were supposed to be in uniform, all looking the same and all fully frontally naked, Salzman testified. Rainier required the brands on the women to be on full display and they should all appear happy. If they weren't to his satisfaction, he would sometimes request a new photo. If our legs weren't spread enough, we'd have to spread our legs more, Salzman said, adding that the group members were aware that his preferences skewed towards up close vaginal pictures. So Salzman can somehow say, oh, the DOS meetings were all me, yet testify to this. Rainier was the one controlling these women, including Salzman herself. That's no excuse whatsoever for her actions, but he was the one at the top of this pyramid. And understand here, I'm not talking about the business. Fuck the business. The MLM is the least of his crimes. I'm talking about the pyramid-shaped cult that was going on. DOS members were also required to do penance for perceived misdeeds. Such penance included paddlings with a leather strap, which Rainier would occasionally supervise remotely via a conference call. He called in and wanted to make sure we were flicking the wrist hard enough, Salzman said. She testified that a fellow DOS member, Daniela Padilla, told her Rainier had once been violent towards her after accusing her of being in a prideful state. She had been on the floor and he had kicked her, Salzman recounted Padilla telling her. Rainier had also planned to build a dungeon in the basement of the sorority house, and Padilla purchased various BDSM sex toys for use during penance, as a sex toy company owner testified last week. 
Padilla had also planned to purchase a cage, though she canceled the order shortly after the inner workings of DOS were made public in the spring of 2017. Rainier also drafted a public statement defending the existence of DOS while simultaneously denying he had anything to do with it. The statement, which was read at trial, accused the media of shaming the women for engaging in consensual activities and spearheading a campaign against the rights of women and alternative lifestyles. At one point in the email, Rainier compared DOS members to authors of the Declaration of Independence. How can you clearly defend something you had no knowledge about? Clearly, so clearly, he knew. Nexium's operations were obviously suspended, and even with the offer of a $10 million bond on the table, Rainier sat in jail. Claire, too, was arrested for racketeering conspiracy, while Allison Mack and Rainier faced charges of sex trafficking, sex trafficking conspiracy, and forced labor conspiracy. But one story stood out above all the others through this hellish process. Those of you that are already familiar with Keith Rainier might already know about this, but to those of you who don't, well, I'm going to warn you that this is probably the most disturbing thing I've found against this man. Although this occurred in 1993 and was reported on by the Times Union in 2012, police ignored these reports until it was too late. A young woman named Rhiannon was just 12 years old when Rainier offered her free tutoring. Rhiannon says that he taught her how to hug back in 1993. But she explains that no, this wasn't limited to hugging. She says he taught her how to hug the way adults do, pelvis to pelvis. Kelvis Rainier took her virginity at the age of 12, before Rhiannon was even in middle school. The Times Union reported in 2012 that the girl liked being able to hang out with Rainier and the other women around him. She thought sex was just part of fitting in. They told me I was smart and took an interest in me. They let me spend every afternoon at their house, she said. It was exciting to be somewhere where people wanted me. I was perfect picking, insecure at the time. To have someone that mature and that well thought of to be interested in me, it was flattering. I was very young, inexperienced, overwhelmed, and out of my league. This video from Times Union of the now adult, then child, that was taken advantage of by Rainier is horrifying. She lists every place they'd ever done it and said, he took my innocence, I can never get that back. Although she signed a deposition back in 1993 and Rainier was accused of raping at least four other children between the ages of 12 to 15 in that time frame, nothing was done. Nothing, at least, that could stop him from creating Nexium and harming even more women. Though it may be some sort of consolidation that he's in prison now, I can only imagine how hard it was for Rhiannon to know that he walked free. Trying to process that at 12 years old, not be taken seriously, and then hear that Rainier did this to countless others, I don't really have words for it. Another woman, Gina Melita, has yet another victim of Rainier to speak out, and finally, during this time, to be taken seriously. Gina says, I was falling asleep watching television, and as I was dozing, he touched my face, my legs, and made a pass. Shortly thereafter, Gina recalls losing her virginity to Rainier and said it was very painful, and a half hour later, Keith said, maybe the second time won't be so bad, and so we did it again. She was 15, he was 24. Gina Hutchinson, the Gina we mentioned earlier in this video, who did a soul much older than her body, as Rainier said, tragically never got to see Keith behind bars. She committed suicide in 2002 by shooting herself in the head. Rainier had told Gina that she was a Buddhist goddess meant to be with him, so even though we can't definitively connect Gina Hutchinson's death to do anything with him, at the very least, I can say she would have been better off not knowing him. The two Ginas in the same year, 1984, should have never endured what they did. Rainier was 24, while both were young teenagers between 14 to 16. Then, in his 30s, it was a 12-year-old. I'm not going to sit here and explain why that's fucked up. If you need to debate that point, you really need to take a look at yourself in the mirror. To anyone that could have possibly defended him until now, what justification is there for this? There's none. There's, There's literally no reason why this ever should have happened in the first place. He was a master manipulator, not some child prodigy born to change the world, as he implies. Mark Vincente himself took the stand during trial, the man that truly allowed his story to break. Times Union wrote, He testified that many people joined Nexium, a purported self-help organization based in Colony to better help themselves to promote good in the world. They ended up being exploited. It's a fraud, it's a lie, he said, choking up. It's this well-intended veneer that covers horrible, incredible evil. Vincente, who spent 12 years at Nexium, touched on several topics Thursday, including films he said Rainier wanted him to make. He said Rainier wanted him to produce a cult-busting film to reject the notion that cults exist. 
Critics of Nexium had for years accused the organization of being cult-like. Rainier suggested they pay a family $1 million to be filmed and portrayed as a cult for all the project to reveal it was untrue, but it was not made. Within Nexium, members were told the word doesn't exist, Vincente testified. He would say, what is a cult, Vincente recalled. With the overabundance of evidence we've gone through, the verdict was guilty as expected. Allison Mack pled guilty, Nancy Salzman pled guilty, and several celebrity members left the cult shortly before things blew up or the moment it began to be reported on. Personally, I think they should still be investigated and held accountable, but I understand that at the time, there were bigger fish to fry. Sentencing has been delayed multiple times now as this case is still ongoing. Although the crimes have been committed and the verdicts given, there's still more to the story here. Because Nexium was pretending to be a business, and this means they can be sued as such. The 189-page complaint from 80 victims against 19 higher-ups in Nexium was filed on January 28, 2020, this year. Reading the complaint, I can hardly believe that this is still happening in our world today, so recently. Often when I hear about shady businesses, their worst acts have been decades ago. I'm not saying that excuses anything, but at least it feels like there's progress being made to see those older dates. But this wasn't shut down until two and a half years ago, and what the complaint alleges is nothing short of utterly terrifying. I can't possibly go through every page with you guys, but I'll read an overview so you can get a feel for the insanity these people endured. I'm also going to name every single one of the 19 plaintiffs now because I think it's important to have these names exposed so long as they are free to live their lives with maybe some minor consequences, some without, the public deserves to know that they are dangerous to society. Keith Rainier, Nancy Salzman, Claire Bronfman, Sarah Bronfman, Lauren Salzman, Allison Mack, Kathy Russell, Karen Utrainer, Dr. Brandon Porter, Dr. Danielle Roberts, Daniela Padilla Bergeson, Rosa Laura Junko, Loretta J. Garza Davia, Monica Duran, Nikki Klein, these people are the individual defendants, aside from obviously Nexium Corporation itself. These people are the doctors that held members down while branding them, the members that convinced others to trust them that they should join, and they should have this follow them every time you search their names. So what did they do exactly? Page 5 states how the plaintiffs were dependent on the defendants to an unhealthy extent. On a near daily basis, these victims were told that they were failing to advance on the stripe path, Nexium terminology, and improve their careers, income, and well being because they were not working hard enough. Once defendants had stripped members of their psychological defenses, they exploited these highly vulnerable people for advantage and gain. This included coercing members into working for the defendants on exchanges in which they would be severely undercompensated or even uncompensated. For for their labors. Quitting was a failure and would result in immense shame and humiliation. Then on page six, there is literally an entire section called Illegal Experimentation on Human Beings. When I saw that headline, my stomach dropped. There was that much, that much involvement of human experimentation that there's an entire page in the lawsuit on it. They state that at least 40 members of the Nexium community trusting in Rainier, Nancy Salzman, and defendant Dr. Brandon Porter were subjected to human fright experiments in which individuals were seated in front of a video display with EEG electrodes placed on their skulls to measure brain waves. These subjects believe they were going to watch a talk by Rainier, but instead were subjected to scenes of escalating violence, including actual extremely graphic footage of the brutal beheading and dismemberment of five women in Mexico. And we're only on page six out of 189 pages. Page seven, first held masters, high positions in DOS, were tasked with selecting attractive, trustworthy women who would become sexual partners for Rainier. Recruits were told that they were being invited to join a sisterhood, which would empower them to overcome the weaknesses that Rainier and other defendants taught them to held back in life. Recruits were told that DOS offered a unique opportunity to enter a one-on-one -on -one mentorship with women who had been elevated in stature within the community and who thus were looked up to as role models. Page seven continues saying that collateral had to be provided provided, the nude images or videos we mentioned earlier, even letters falsely accusing close family members or unethical or illegal conduct. Page eight states in black and white that DOS was a master-slave relationship explained as no different from a guru and disciple or mentor-mentee. If that were the case, why not call it teacher and student? Well, we know why. 
This was the opposite of empowering. These women were stripped of any power they had. They were meant to be controlled. DOS slaves were subjected to a severely abusive environment, which included caloric deprivation, sleep deprivation, arduous physical labor, performance of menial tasks, and a variety of punishments for any failure to fully comply with their master's commands. They had to check in with their masters when they awoke and when they went to bed with text messages of good morning M and good night M. They had to be available 24 hours a day due to readiness drills. They would get a text with a question mark, nothing more, and they had one minute to respond with ready M. Otherwise, they'd have consequences like cold showers, hold themselves in a plank position, be ridiculed, or strip naked and be paddled. Again, this is not a teacher and a student relationship. This is slavery. This is torture. Rainier was convincing and coercing people to be his sex slaves. And the stories each plaintiff gives are similar, how they trusted him and how they thought he was this brilliant man that could help them. Jane Doe 1, page 14, says that she was a resident of Mexico, then traveled to Albany, New York, lured with promises of training and employment as a computer programmer and personal tutoring and mentoring by Rainier. She was 16 years old. Rainier and his inner circle spent two years grooming her, ultimately leading her to believe that having sex with Rainier was necessary for their relationship to evolve to a higher stage, which she continued to believe would lead her to partnering with Rainier in this development of his revolutionary technology and securing the Ivy League university-level education she'd been promised. At some point, Jane Doe 1 informed Rainier that she was attracted to another man and experiencing romantic feelings. She informed Rainier that she would no longer have sex with him. Therefore, he and his members of his inner circle began a campaign of extreme isolation, culminating in her confinement to a room with virtually no human contact for nearly two years, during which her pleas to be let out were either rejected or ignored. Defendants eventually sent her back to Mexico with almost no money and no identity papers, which they had taken and refused to give back to her. This one woman story is just one of 80. Jane Doe too, a woman that was struggling to overcome past trauma, was instructed by Allison Mack to have sex with Rainier. Mac insisted Jane Doe 2 photograph the encounter and said she had permission to enjoy the experience. Jane Doe 3 joined to become more self-fulfilling, gave collateral, and was also ordered to have sex with Rainier. She acquiesced out of fear of punishment and release and eventually left the community. Jane Doe 4, a very similar, almost verbatim experience. Jane Doe 5 gave Lauren Salzman several rounds of collateral and was then branded. She moved home several times out of fear, going into hiding. Jane Doe 7 was instructed to hold her feet while she was branded, and she realized she was being videotaped. She was branded on her pubic region with a cauterizing pen in a process that was extremely painful. The wound did not close for two months. Jane Doe 10 and 11 both participated in readiness drills and provided services to their master. Jane Doe 19 had false police charges filed against her and was unable to sleep for 12 days after the electrodes experiment. Jane Doe 22 suffered from Tourette's syndrome and was subjected to several verbal abuses that led to severe psychological trauma. And there's so much more. Women being taught they're inferior, being ordered to smash their face into a tree or let themselves pass out, and the results of the human fright experiments which still haunt people to this day. I scrolled through the whole thing, and let me tell you, it reads like something out of a horror novel. It's pure slavery and experimentation. Rainier enjoyed watching people suffer. That's all there is to it. After reading about the charges and the lawsuit, I want nothing more than these people to be locked away for the longest time possible. They are a serious danger to the world, and they treat people as less than human. Brainwashed or not, these dozens of men and women deserve justice. I hope they can get it, and Rainier suffers the same hell he put countless people, even children, through. In the end, one gigantic problem is how legitimate Rainier seemed how he got away with this for so, so long. The Ethical Science Foundation formed by the Bronfman sponsored him and a $20 million check in 2004. He was named one of the smartest men alive by the Guinness Book of World Records. Keith had celebrity endorsements in people doing his dirty work. He was a genius, but a genius at manipulating others. Hopefully, he rots in jail for it and later hell. So many of these Jane Doe's in this lawsuit didn't want to step forward, and it makes me wonder if there are still those who haven't. I hope people can find them and speak out in groups like this, even if it's scary. If Mark and Sarah didn't, we don't know how this Nexium story would have actually ended or how many more women and girls Rainier could have harmed. But if I could only say one thing about Nexium, it would be this. MLMs are pyramid schemes designed as businesses. This is a sex cult disguised as an MLM. And with that note, that's where I'm going to end today's pretty disturbing video. 
Let me know your guys' thoughts in the comment section down below. I'm sure many of you have a lot of opinions about a lot of this quite horrifying information I've shared with you today. Make sure to like the video, spread around this information, and subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. If you need to see more content from me, perhaps something a little more lighthearted, my description box has all of my social media links, second channel for my puppy Casper, and the collaboration channel with some of my buddies in the channel Sad Milk. So I love you guys, I hope you have a good day, and I'll see you in the next one. Bye guys.